Good morning, and uh, welcome to church this morning. It's great to have you here, and uh, well, especially warm welcome to those of you in the room, but also not forgetting those of you joining us on the live stream, either coming to us live now or, or watching a recording later on in the week. We still have a good number of people every week joining us uh, online, so it's really good to have you with us as well. Uh, this morning we have uh, Gary Bott speaking to us um, to bring to a conclusion our series that we've been running through on the, in the book of James. And so uh, Gary will be bringing that to us later. We've got some really interesting lessons to learn from James. And we also have um, a very interesting testimony from, from Heather coming up later as well. So, um, and thank you to, uh, to Roger and the band for for, playing the, uh, for leading us in worship this morning. But be, I've just got a couple more notices to bring to you, but first of all, uh, Vicky is just gonna come and give you a, a very quick message as well. Thank you. Um, I just want to highlight the Ladies' Day that is happening on the 24th of this month. It's coming around fast now. Uh, we're gonna be thinking about freedom and soaring on the wings of, like an eagle. Um, love you to join us. There's some flyers in the foyer. Um, I'm in beginners this morning, but if you can grab me afterwards, I'm happy to talk about it as well. Um, that's all I want to say. I think. Hope to see you there. Great, thank you. And the other thing, while you're in the foyer, uh, you'll notice there is a, a wooden offering box on the, the welcome desk there. Um, we haven't always remembered to put it out, but those of you who aren't able to give online as, as we've moved towards that more uh, in recent times, we do also have that facility if you need to make um, an offering to the church in, in cash, whether it's coins or notes or, whatever, or a check or whatever you want to do, there's a box there to put it in, and that will be there in the foyer each, um, each Sunday for you to, to make those offerings. Um, also, a quick reminder that this... Um, uh, this month, we'll be having our special church members meeting on the 21st of September. So you, you'll know that we've got uh, next Sunday and the Sunday after, we're meeting some prospective new members of our, our ministry team. And so we want to come together and, and talk about that and pray about that as a church together in a special church members meeting. You'll have, if you're a member, you'll have had a notice about that and a letter come through about that. But just a, a reminder for Wednesday the 21st. And if we just have the... Um, the first slide up, Ben, thank you. If you haven't already been invited or asked about this or asked to be part of it, then this meal on the Friday, the 16th of September, um, is especially for you, and we'd love more people to join. We already have quite a number of people invited and coming along to that. Um, so if you haven't received an invitation, please ask me or one of the other elders uh, this morning um, for that. Um, and we need you to have contacted the church office by this coming Friday. Uh, or Thursday probably would be better, Thursday the 8th of September, if you could get in touch with Mary in the office to confirm that you want to book a place for that. And also, a quick reminder, we've got Through the Bible coming up in October. So on Sunday the 15th, Saturday the 15th of October, uh, we have Through the Bible coming to give us an overview of the Old Testament. Um, I remember having a, a session a bit like this when I was at, at Bible College, and I found it amazingly interesting someone who uh, i thought i knew the bible but to get an overview of the whole new testament uh, the whole old testament in one go really helps to put all the different little stories that we've uh, we're familiar with into a bigger picture so i'd encourage anybody it's designed for anyone over the age of 11 and it's a free event it runs from 10 until 4 30 and there'll be refreshments provided so please do book online for that you'll see the notice there with the um the address that's also in the in the bulletin so please book your place on that if you'd like to join us for that day. I'd also just like to tell you a little bit about um, the rooftop. You'll know that I um, work a little bit with the rooftop, and so does Alan, and a number of other people in the church here are involved with the rooftop. This is an organization that was uh, started by Dennis Peathers, a member of our church, about 10 or so years ago. And the primary objective of, of the rooftop um, is to bring Christians together to consider the communities in which they live, to ask God to help them to see it the way that he sees it, and for him to break their hearts in the way that, for the things that break his heart. Um, once, we've, once you then establish what Jesus is doing in your community already, then we, there's, a, there's a sort of a, an encouragement to ask people to commit to joining Jesus in that mission that he's already doing and to participate in what he's already doing amongst the people that, that we live amongst. 
Um, and this is obviously to make disciples or followers of Jesus who are then going on to make other followers of Jesus. And, uh, and that's fulfilling the, what we call the Great Commission that Jesus gave us to do. So this is something that we need to be continually engaging with to, to ensure that we stay on track with what God wants us involved in. And over the last 10 years, these events have been happening, happening all around the world as, as Dennis travels around different places. He's in the United States at the moment, and I've been with him to four or five different countries this year already, to, and he's been to many more. And there are li literally hundreds of, um, of churches, probably thousands of churches that will be will have already done these events, but we're encouraging churches around the world to all do one on a particular day, which is the 2nd of October uh, this year, and to have this kind of uh, awakening experience um, all, all together. So we're going to be holding one here at this church on Sunday, the 2nd of October. Um, it will be timed for around about 5 p.m., so it might start a bit before that, but do ask Kim um, Witterick for more details of that, and there will be more information coming out a little bit nearer the time. But um, the idea is that at 5 p.m. in each time zone around the world, these events will be happening. Um, so that's just to, to tell you a little bit about that. But if I could just go on to the next slide, there is obviously, because it's happening all around the world, we want to be able to tell people and show people what um, it has been happening and what, what is going on. So there will be a 24-hour live stream held during that time, starting with... A 5 p.m. in New Zealand, which is uh, unfortunately 5 a.m. here in the UK, right the way through to when we're finishing in Hawaii uh, later that, that day, having um, had a, a fairly long time. So we're doing that from a central hub in Chelmsford, which is Life Church, and that will be our kind of our broadcasting base for the day. Alan, Patel, and I are trying to put together a team of people. We've got quite a few volunteers who've come forward already to help with the logistics on that day. But if there's anyone else who would like to help, whether it's um, just in a, in a sort of a, a runner capacity helping move things around or someone who's really good at organising and keeping us on track and on time, or if you've got uh, skill, technical skills can help with some of the, um, the camera or computer elements of that as well, then please do speak to Alan or I um, to be part of that in Chelmsford. Um, so that's going to be a really good time of, of uh, encouragement to see what God is doing in all these countries around the world. And finally, I just—I don't know how many of you use the um, the U version Bible app, but I know today's verse of the day, uh, I thought was quite apt for as we come together this morning. Um, September is a time when new things start. A lot of the children are going back to school this week, and some people may be starting new jobs. There's always, it's a time of new beginnings, isn't it? Often in September, and so that can often play on our minds a little bit, and we might be excited or anxious about some of those things, but. Together we can come to this morning before God. And, and in Psalm 100, verse 2, it says, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. So whatever is going on in your life, right now we're coming together to worship God, to praise him, and to um, intentionally uh, be glad this morning. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Dave. Can we uh, stand together this morning? and pretty much do exactly what that verse says that Dave just read out. Let's worship the Lord with gladness.
going to read for us um, a couple of verses from Deuteronomy 31. The next song is actually peppered with verses. You'll see it as you go through. You think, oh, I recognise that phrase. I recognise that phrase from the Bible. This is Deuteronomy 31. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail or abandon you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you or abandon you. Shadow of 
probably have noticed that Heather has made her way subtly to the front. Um, Heather's got a brilliant testimony to share with us today in person, which I think is really powerful to hear. And so we'll hand over to you, Heather, to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's great and slightly terrifying to be standing in front of you today. Um, I'm an infant's teacher, so I'm really confident about talking to four to seven-year-olds. It turns out that this doesn't apply when I speak to over sevens who won't necessarily sit up straight and listen because I promised them a sticker at the end. <laughs> but in fairness to Gary, I did volunteer. I felt I must share my own recent experience of James 5's promise that the prayers of faithful people have a powerful effect. God has given me a second chance at life, so I need to tell you of my own experience of his goodness and the genuine difference I feel that your prayers at Billericay Baptist Church in April, May and June of this year made to my recovery. My story starts on March the 28th this year. It was an ordinary Monday morning. I took my mother-in-law shopping to Marks and Spencer's in Lakeside. We had lunch out. I took her home. I wrote some Easter cards. Then I suddenly got the onset of a headache. Unusual for me, I rarely get any aches and pains. I said to my husband David, who was at home, I'm going to lie down for a couple of minutes. I took two paracetamol. Then as soon as I got upstairs, I have what the NHS describe as a thundercrack headache. I have never felt pain like it. I felt that my head and the back of my neck were going to explode. I asked David to come upstairs. I asked him to phone for an ambulance. And then I passed out. And I can remember very little for the next five days. Apparently, it took an hour and 40 minutes for the ambulance to arrive. And first, I was taken to Basildon, but then I was transferred to Queen's Hospital, as they have a specialist neurology department. There, I was diagnosed with having a substantial subacronoid bleed, which is a brain hemorrhage, likened to a stroke. Having been put on a general neurology ward two days after I'd been admitted, my condition suddenly deteriorated, and David was rung at 11 o'clock at night to say I was being transferred to intensive care. 
The consultant told him they were between a rock and a hard place. If they couldn't get my blood pressure up, I'd have another stroke. If my blood pressure went too high, the bleed on my brain would restart. To David, at least, who'd read up about my condition, it seemed my life was in the balance. David convinced himself I wasn't coming home, but he is a catastrophic thinker. <laughs> my three daughters, who are all Christians, were equally convinced that if I came home, I'd be a changed person, either physically or mentally. I remained in intensive care for the next 11 nights. So how did I learn to trust God and you at this time? And how did your prayers help me? Firstly, I don't know about you, but I have to admit that my faith wavered at the start of COVID in 2020. I didn't make good choices in the early months when faced with this worldwide problem. For more months than I wish to remember, I found I was looking at the news rather than my Bible. And far from reassuring others, I was voicing my own concerns about COVID to other people. I definitely took a worldly attitude rather than a calm Christian approach. My faith was under attack. I prayed less and less and I worried more. In hospital in March 2022, it was totally different. Physically, it was a real struggle. I couldn't move my neck or my legs after the hemorrhage. I could only sit up if I was propped up with pillows and even trying to lean forward long enough for a nurse to put a pillow behind my head was a challenge. I was bed bound and attached to multiple drips for two weeks. I was also very sleep deprived as the lights were on 24 hours a day in intensive care and my medication was given every two hours, 24 hours a day. So if I slept, it was for a maximum of 60 minutes at a time. And even sleep for that long was unusual. I was almost completely dependent on the nurses around me for care. I remember thinking that if the fire alarm went off, I'd never make it out. I felt incredibly vulnerable. However, very early on, I made a conscious decision to put my faith totally in God. Whether I lived or died, I knew I was choosing God to be with me every step of the way. In the first few days, I had a dream or a vision of me swimming in the sea with various signs around me, one of which said God in capital letters. I knew God and his Holy Spirit were with me, but at that point, I couldn't reach out and grab the board I wanted or experience God's total peace, but I believed he could hear me calling. Many miracles were already happening around me. First of all, Roger sent my husband David Psalm 121 and asked David to read it to me. My David, he won't mind me saying, would not describe himself as a Christian, but he insisted on reading verses 1 to 8 of Psalm 121 at the start and end of each hospital visit. In my wildest dreams, I had never imagined David reading Bible verses to me. But here he was reading a much-loved psalm twice a visit, and he was choking back the tears as he read it. I struggled to read anything at this time as I had double vision. So those repeated readings were really precious, and the word protection, help, guard at night stayed in my mind after David left. David also brought everyone's lovely cards and encouraging messages into hospital to read to me. After a week, David brought into hospital a slightly old-fashioned card with a selection of prayers and Bible verses that an elderly friend had sent. The verses on it were from Philippians 4. You probably know them. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It was at that point I was overwhelmed with God's presence and spirit, and a sense of peace that did not transcend all understanding. I felt it was a message from God. In intensive care, your identity is taken away. I was allowed no personal possessions. I wore a hospital gown. My wedding rings were removed. My watch was taken. At times, I had no phone. And I was under surveillance 24 hours a day. But I kept this card on my bed rail as a visual reminder that if I trusted God and prayed, along with all the other people I knew were praying for me too, God would listen and guide me through whatever came my way. When I closed my eyes, the card was the last thing I saw. And when I opened my eyes, I really did feel God's spirit fill me with joy as I was reminded that God was literally by my side. As I reached out to God, I felt his presence more tangibly. As James says in chapter 4, come near to God and God will come near to you. I've referred to miracles happening throughout my stay in hospital. And as you may know, just over a week after my hemorrhage, I had brain surgery to repair where the artery and vein had severed, causing the bleed. 
One thing James stresses when he writes is the importance of strong Christian relationships with each other to help each other through times of trouble. I am very fortunate. I have discovered I have a lot of Christian friends. A week after I'd been in hospital, David sent out a message at 6.20 to Roger and all my Christian friends saying that although he'd had a good visit to see me in hospital that day, there was still no news about when my brain surgery would go ahead. Two hours later, David had a call from my surgeon saying they were going to operate the next day. James says the, powers, the prayers of believers really do have a powerful effect. I'm convinced that the surgeon's phone call that night was a direct answer to intercessionary prayer from Tuesday Zoom's prayer group and the prayers of my family and friends. Time and again throughout my recovery, I have had such a strong sense of people praying for me. I have been overwhelmed by the sense that people are on this journey with me and pleading with God on my behalf. Unlike at the start of COVID, I made a conscious decision in hospital not to research subacronoid hemorrhage on the internet <laughs> or the long-term effects of having this type of brain bleed, to focus on God rather than worldly advice. David kindly started to read out what the NHS said about my condition, sometimes being fatal and having long-term side effects, but I stopped him. I decided I would trust God instead and take things day by day. I don't always get it right, but I believe I've been given a second chance at life, and I want to use it to serve well. I want to thank every one of you here who read about me in the church notices and prayed for me at home and on Tuesday Zooms. The consultant wrote to me this month to say I'd made a remarkable recovery. I think of it as a miraculous recovery, due in part to a wonderful NHS. But more importantly, as James 5 says, because the prayers of faithful people have a powerful effect. Thank you very much. Powerful testimony. Uh, thank you, Heather, for doing that. I just want to pray for Heather now. I think it's really important. Father, just want to thank you for uh, Heather's testimony of, of your love, your grace, your mercy, and your healing. Uh, Father, I just was struck uh, uh, of the power that you have when we pray. And Father, I want to thank you uh, for, for the witness that we have just heard of with Heather, just, just giving that um, kind of... of uh, kind of grace and mercy that you have given her. Lord, I pray your protection over her. I pray your protection over her, Lord, as she's been so bold to stand up and share this. Father, I pray your protection uh, and that you would guard her and keep her and David as well and the whole family uh, in, in, in your hands at this time. Uh, but Lord, we thank you for it and pray you a blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Knowing that Heather was going to share this morning and knowing some of that story already, it, it felt appropriate to only sing one hymn. And uh, I'd like us to stand and sing that together. What a friend we have in Jesus.
Lord God, we thank you for those words. And we want to stand together and declare that we believe them. That we have the utmost friend in Jesus who stands before you, our Father, and pleads our cause. Thank you, Jesus, that you love every single one of us. You loved us to death. We thank you, Jesus, that you are seeking a home in the hearts of every person that will accept you. And Father, we thank you now for the opportunity to listen to your word. We thank you for Gary. We pray your Holy Spirit to minister to each one of us through him and for him to be filled by your spirit as he speaks. So, Lord, give us open ears, open hearts, and a willingness to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please sit down. Morning. Good to see you all. Are we all ready for September? Yes. A few grumbles here and there. Some parents going, yes, kids go back to school, and some teachers going, <laughs> uh, We've been following uh, James uh, over the last, oh, goodness knows how long now, and um, it's, it's just always a privilege to go through a book, uh, really, and I know a lot of people have, have fed back, been really blessed by going through James in this, in this way, and... Um, Heather, I just want to thank you again for, for what you shared this morning. I know when we, we met up just after you come out of hospital, I, I knocked on your door expecting David to be kind of, yes, come in, she's here, and there you were saying, do you want a cup of tea? Uh, I was blown away, really, by how well you were. And we, we, probably, we sat down for a good while just talking about hospitals, didn't we, and, and stuff that we kind of both gone through. And it was, uh, it's just lovely to hear that testimony. And um, I think many of us, can um, share testimony like Heather has shared this morning uh, of God's provision, God's grace, God's mercy uh, in time of need. And we praise God that Heather has come through this ordeal uh, with perseverance <laughs> and patience in prayer. And that's what we're looking at this morning. Uh, James's final uh, part, the parting note in this letter to this young church. Uh, and um, I believe this has been, been beneficial to us all. And I'm going to read this whole transcript of scripture. I'm going to use one of the church Bibles. Um, so if you want a Bible, we are allowed to give them out if you'd like one. If not, follow on your phone or just listen to my dulcet tones. Uh, whichever one uh, you'd like to go with. So James 5, 7 to 20. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessing those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you'll be condemned. Is any one of you in trouble? They should pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any of you sick? They should call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. 
And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crop, crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring them back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of God. Not enough Anglicans in here to say thanks be to God, but that's okay. That's, oh, you did write thank you at the back there, that's cool. Um, <laughs> two big parts really to, to this final uh, part in shot from James. Um, and it's, it starts off in verse 7, I'm just going to move this, starts off in verse 7 with that call to be patient. <laughs> Not a patient, but to be patient. Between verses 7 and 12, James says seven times to be patient, to wait and endure. We don't like that, do we? We don't like to be patient. We don't want to wait. We don't want to endure. I want it now, now, now. And we live in that world that gives us now, now, now. So actually to be patient, to wait, to endure... Even as adults, we struggle with that. Toddlers, forget it. (laughs) Absolutely forget it. We want it now. But James is saying, be patient. And he's saying to wait and be patient for the return of Jesus, to the return of our Lord. He uses the reference of farmers which I find quite interesting having come back off holiday in Norfolk and seeing, probably as most of you have been on holiday and seen in the UK, farmers' fields ready, ready to be harvested. Where we were staying in Norfolk, we would drive around to where we were going or have a little walk if I was able, and we'd see this one truck going round with this farmer in. And he'd be stopping and he'd be pulling up and he'd be going into his field and he'd be breaking an ear of corn or wheat or barley off and he'd just be going through it and looking at it. Throw it on the ground, get in a truck and drive away. And we were like, not yet. (laughs) Not yet. And we see him the next day in a field a little bit further away and it would do exactly the same. And he'd do this process over and over again whilst we were watching, kind of like, and we were like, not yet. And we, we started to look at the weather map. <laughs> is it going to rain? Is he going to miss it? Is he going to miss the opportunity? And then at some point, we don't know, all we heard was this rumbling of a combine harvester just off in the distance in a field. And that combine harvester didn't stop for about 48 hours, all the way through the night just gathering up this harvest. And we would go out in, like, during the day and then we'd just see that, that cornfield, that barley field that was once standing high and everyone was like, let's run through it for fun. Um, we'd be like, no, I'm not doing that. Um, all of a sudden was nothing but just stubble. That was the right time. But he was patient. This farmer was patient. It takes time for things to grow. It takes time for a kettle to boil. You can't make it boil any quicker than what it goes with the scientific way that water boils. You can't make it, it takes time for a bud to bloom. Thank you for the flowers this morning and every week, they're wonderful. But it took time for this to grow, to then be able to be something that we could look at in beauty. And it takes time for faith to grow. And James is saying, be patient, specifically for the Lord's return, but be patient. And we must be patient, patient for the Lord's coming, not inactive, like a train passenger, but patient and active to see his kingdom grow. And in verse 8, James goes on to say, do not grumble against each other. Love that word, grumble. (laughs) Something, I need to use that word a lot more, I think. Not to do it, but just use it in general life. But do not grumble against each other. I looked at this a few weeks back, that we're not to quarrel, we're not to kind of have that grumbling nature, that judging nature, but to encourage and lift one another up. From verse 10, 
James uses the example of the prophets who endured and persevered. James is encouraging these uh, young Christians in this church, as I've spoken before in James, uh, this young church, to encourage them to remember back these prophets that you've read about, that you've read about in synagogue, that you've heard of, that you've got this Torah that you can read. Look at the Old Testament that they had. Read back and be encouraged and look at Job. Job's one of those passages in the Bible that we kind of, I don't want to be depressed, so I'll steer clear of that one. But actually, as you read the book of Job, you really start to see the faith of someone in perseverance when he is afflicted, when he is going through the worst of times. And James is kind of like using Job as an example to say, I know what you're going through is pretty tough. Let's compare it with Job and be encouraged. Be encouraged to persevere. Whilst many of us have suffered and persevered recently, we look at Job and thank God for our small part of suffering. That's not to make light of anything any of us have gone through. Myself, Heather, whoever it might be. We've all gone through stuff. That's not to make light of it. But it actually, I believe, helps bring perspective. Perspective for what we go through. Job went through hell on earth. Literally, if you read Job and you keep reading Job, it's just hell on earth for him. Everything taken away. His entire family destroyed. His entire livestock, his, his, his business is destroyed. And then his health. Then he gets full of boils and sores and everything else. And then he's got some friends who turn up and they grumble and moan about God and kind of persuade him to go against God and everything else like that. And you kind of keep reading it and you're thinking, wow. And then God just says to Job, stand there and take this like a man. It's those moments you're kind of like going, oops. <laughs> I think Job overstepped the line there. And then God gives this whole... Um, lot of evidence of saying, this is who I am. I am God. I am God. Who are you to come against me and challenge me? And it's at that point, I think, there's that realisation for Job, is just like, you are God. And in that recognition, in that understanding, God restores everything to Job. And maybe some of the things that we've gone through, maybe we haven't got everything fully restored. In glory we will will have. We'll have everything restored. And God wants to restore that grace and mercy in our lives so that we may be able to pour that out to others. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, which then goes on to produce hope. And hope does not disappoint. And that's Romans 5. Just a little side note from James here in in verse 12. Notice that James says, Above all, do not swear by heaven, earth, or any other oath. Simply put, don't swear on your mother's grave or anything like that. Just be honest. Just be honest. Let your yes be yes. Your no be no. Honesty and transparency are the factors that James is talking about to this young church. And it's also for us as well. When we say we're going to do something, let's do it. If we say we can't do something, be honest. Say, I can't do that. Don't be like, yeah, I can do that. And then, no, I don't want to do it. Just, it's just simple stuff. And I feel there's actually a few things. I've been away with my father-in-law the last part of the week, uh, who's, who's coming to speak in a few weeks' time, which is brilliant. Um, and, and we were just talking about being a Christian and, and, and everything that's kind of... And you, for those of you that know Bob, you know where he's at with this kind of stuff and, 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 and where we're possibly coming in our date of 
Jesus' return, etc., etc. It could be imminent, who knows? Um, but we were just saying there's a few things that we are really noticing that Christians are starting to bring into their lives that aren't of God. More and more. As the enemy increases in what he's trying to do, we need to increase in what God does in our lives. Simple things. Fingers crossed. It'll be all right. Oh, good luck. I can't do fingers crossed on this hand, but that's another thing. (laughs) You laugh too much there. (laughs) It's just simple little things, some little superstitious things that kind of come into our lives that that, that the world is kind of like doing, and we kind of imbibe that. We've just got to be really careful. You know, as, 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 as Heather was saying, you know, during COVID, we've kind of like got anxious and fearful and worried about this, and actually we weren't concentrating, and we don't concentrate enough on what God is doing, on his word. So it's just like... oh. Good luck in your exams. I don't believe I ever said that to any young person. Good luck in your exams. I hope I didn't. For any young people that are all upstairs, so. (laughs) Did I, Oliver? No, thank you. But it's just one of those things that I think we've just got to be really careful about, these little things that come into our lives. And there are other practices that maybe we've been drawn into Uh, that we need just to check with our spirit and God's spirit um, to see if they are of God. But I think that's probably uh, for another day, otherwise I will completely go off tangent. At this point, James turns to prayer. No, that's the wrong one. Go back in. He turns to prayer. And we've heard this morning an awesome testimony of what happens when we pray. Not just Heather's prayers, not just Christian prayers, but but all of us. We all have been praying. In verse 12, he uses two examples. Sorry, verse 13, actually. Um, It says, if any of you is in trouble or suffering, pray. Simple as that, pray. Those that are suffering, pray. Pray. Those that are cheerful, interesting that you brought up that psalm. Those that are cheerful, James says, let him sing songs of praise. That's what we've done this morning. Sing, rejoice, thank God. We don't do enough of it in our lives. For those who are sick, to call the elders to anoint with oil and pray. And actually, after communion... Um, we've agreed as elders that we'd like to do that. If, if anybody would like to be anointed with oil and we would pray for you, um, for, for any sickness, whatever it is, that's what we want to do this morning. Let's do what James is saying. And we don't have to do it after a service or anything else like that. If anyone is sick, and uh, cool. Roger, Roger's, Roger's on the ball when it comes to the pastoral care of the church. And, and nothing more pleases us as leaders. He's actually when he says, could you come and pray for me? Anoint me with oil, please. I still remember Andy Gowland's story of, of asking to be anointed with oil. I had the whole chuffing lot thrown over him. Everything, give it to me, everything. Just dripping with oil. I wasn't there at the time, but I like to say that story because it makes me laugh. <laughs> and I just think, yeah, why not? Be anointed with oil. James does not limit those who can pray for you, though, just to elders. Okay? He also says in verse 16 to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. And confession and forgiveness seem to be really intertwined with the scriptures, I believe, here. I know when I've messed up, I need to confess. To put things right with God. And sometimes I've shared that with others that I trust. And they can continue to pray for me. 
I'm left a little bit baffled sometimes when I hear of a Christian brother or sister who has actually got something against another Christian brother or sister. It baffles me when I read scripture that we can do that. I'm not judging because I point the finger back at me as well. It's so, it's so easy, isn't it, to, to criticise somebody or, or pick somebody up on something. And it just, you just harbour that kind of little bit of bitterness t- towards that person because they didn't do a job properly or I could have done it better or whatever it might be. And James says back in verse 9, do not grumble against one another. We've got to stop grumbling <laughs> about others. See, I've used that word a lot more in the last few minutes than we've got to. I mean, whether it's a right theology or not, but I actually do think that there's a, there's, there's a form of unforgiveness that's starting there. We're constantly grumbling about that person that does that thing. Oh, and it really winds me up and it's just frustrating. It's just it's sowing that, kind, that tiny little seed of doubt, of bitterness, but we have to be careful. I, when I came across this passage of scripture, and, and um, as a young man, it kind of like really, really made me stop in my tracks. In Matthew six fourteen and fifteen, it says, "For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive." your sins. That's a powerful passage of scripture. One I don't think we pick up enough on. This scripture is directly after Jesus teaches us how to pray, being the Lord's Prayer. And I think actually it will be good to say that when we have communion, collectively. Collectively. In confessing to one another and praying for one another, James says we will be healed because the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. And I have always wondered about when I pray for people or people, am I righteous? Am I in a righteous frame of mind to be praying for this person? Because five minutes ago, I was throwing everything I could at Tottenham's front line because they couldn't score. (laughs) Okay, that's a stupid little example. But actually, you know what I mean? Five, ten minutes ago, we were having these thoughts against somebody in the church. And then we just got a text come through to say, please pray for me, I'm in a bit of a dire situation. Okay, I'll do that. Are we righteous? When we pray for one another. I read a book by an American pastor who's big into to healing and seeing people healed and whether you know, we've got different theologies and understanding on how God does that. And one of the things that he, um, in his experience of, of seeing, was he probably saw 5 to 10% of people that came to him for prayer that were actually healed. The 90 to 95% went away not healed. And he said it was, he feels it was based on unforgiveness. He would go to people and he'd say, I'm, I'm not going to pray for you. <laughs> she sounds weird for a pastor to say, no, I'm not going to pray for you. He says, I want you to go away and I want you to go through any unforgiveness that you have in your life. Anyone that's upset you, parents, somebody at school when you were five or six berated you and you've hated them ever since. Go and forgive them. Go and forgive them. And he uses an example in this book of these four ladies with, with arthritis. And I'm not saying that, that you know, we need to do this in order to cure all things. That's what, you know, prayer is an amazingly wonderful and strange thing when it comes to healing. But he told these ladies that he's not going to pray for them until they go away and deal with their stuff. 
And a few weeks later, I don't know how long it was, months it might have been, he notices he was just talking to these ladies in church and none of them were stooped over. None of them had aches and pains or anything else like that. They were just talking to him and he said, you don't need me to pray for you anymore. No, it's amazing. He went home, dealt with all the issues that I'd been holding on to for my entire life of parents and schooling and whatever someone had said about and just decided to forgive them all and just say, Lord, I'm at your mercy. They were healed. Now, I don't know the, the, the ins and outs and all of that, and I, I, I can't be saying, well, if you do this and that, but there are things, I think, that are key in Scripture that we do need to confess. We do need to seek forgiveness of things that have gone on in our lives. Again, just at the end of this passage, James uses the prophet Elijah as an example, an encouraging example of someone who was righteous when it came to prayer. Now, we may feel that we could never be like Elijah, and I always find Elijah's story amazing and, and, and just like, yeah, that's, that's like any of us, where we see God do amazing things, where God sets fire to pretty much anything that's covered in water, just destroys it. He sees it. And then when he finds out that Jezebel's not too happy about that and wants to kind of hunt him down and fight, you know, get him, he just legs it. He goes and hides. We're weird as human beings. <laughs> we can see God do amazing things. Like the children of Israel saw God do amazing things that yet still say, you've led us out into the wilderness to die. We're thirsty, we're going to die. We set up a golden calf when Moses is up the mountain because he must be destroyed by God. We're fickle, but God still loves us. I think that we can have the power that Elijah uh, had through confession, through forgiveness, and the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's all accessible to us. And James's final word as we look out uh, for those who have wandered from the truth. There seems to be a bit of a blessing uh, bestowed upon the person that brings them back. Um, and I wonder if actually, as the, the band come up and we're going to spend some time in communion, that maybe we could do a couple of things as we approach the Lord's table. And during this song, next song, I'm going to pray in a minute and we have a song to prepare us for this amazing gift that we've been given to remember, we need to deal with some things in our lives. Unforgiveness, let's confess. If there's anybody that has upset you or wound you up, forgive them. And if there's anybody you know that's wandered from the truth, that has wandered from church, that has wandered from knowing Jesus, their first love. Pray for them as we take communion. Pray for them. Because it's amazing here where it says, and I've always, I've always, I've always questioned this time at the last little passage, it says, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Wow. I'd like to go into the theology of that a little bit more. But if that's what James is saying here, you know, let's, let's be praying as we, as we take communion in a bit for ourselves, for confession and forgiveness, and also for those that have wandered. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for James. I want to thank you for his letter. I want to thank you, Lord, for the way that it can inspire us over 2,000 years later. And Lord, I pray for each and every single one of us that your spirit would examine us deeply to see if there's any unforgiveness. <coughs> Father, that we can say that we can be a person who prays righteously. 
that as we pray for people, Father, we would see healing. That's what we want to do. Nothing more than anything, Lord. We just want to see people healed. And I pray, Lord, as we deal with the stuff in our own lives, that you would use us powerfully to pray for one another. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to reflect on what Gary's brought to us, and there's a time now for you to think about some of those things that Gary has just said. And we're going to sing a song kind of to you and over you because it's a song that you won't know because it was written by Josh. And um, it's a lovely song that brings us to the cross. It's a song of thanksgiving. And it's a song of reminder of everything that Jesus has done for us. There may be a point at which you get familiar with it and you want to, to join in. But feel free to listen to the words, see the words as they come up, and uh, reflect and give thanks. All the price you paid at Calvary Where you bore a cross to take my sin And though they scorned you with a crown of thorns You pled, Father, forgive them all With one last breath you cried in Cut and tore by the power of love For your body broke and your blood poured out Covering us with the grace you have So I say thank you for the cross So I say thank you for all you've done, so I say thank you, God. So I say thank you, God. Three days passed and the storm was
Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. We're nothing without you. But we are everything because of your Son. We are your children, your heirs, because of Jesus, because of his sacrifice, because he defeated death, because you rolled away the stone, because he rose again. We can have life. And we thank you, God. Amen. Communion can be very familiar to us. Tagged on at the end of a service. I look forward to the day that we are just eating. (laughs) And communion breaks out. Because that's what happened. That's what was happening. They were eating. And communion broke out. Jesus had something special to say. And before I read those very, very familiar words to us, I think it is important, coming off the back of what I've talked about and what James talks about in prayer, that we collectively say the Lord's Prayer. We can do it individually. But as a church, as a body, as brothers and sisters. And this is the opportunity for you to seek for forgiveness if you've got a little grumble against somebody else that's in the room, somebody that's not here, somebody that's not even a Christian. Set yourself right with God. That's what we come to communion for. I mean, we can do that any time of the day, we know that, but Communion is special. It's a special thing for us to remember that sacrifice of what Jesus did for us. He forgave us everything. So I'm sure we can forgive a few people of a few things. So let's say the Lord's Prayer together, shall we? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. (laughs) 
while they were eating. Jesus took the bread He gave thanks. And then he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Just a simple thing that he did in front of them. If I could have the servers could come and distribute have you got any servers? Yep. Just as it's being distributed, think of those people that you need to forgive. Think of those people that maybe have wandered, that you know of. Hold them in your hearts. Petition God for them. Seek forgiveness for what you have done. your own time eat that bread that was broken for us And Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks. He offered it to them, quite simply. He said, this is my blood of the promise, the covenant, which is poured out for many. 
for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's house. One day we will share this with Jesus. What a wonderful day that will be. So we give thanks to God for Jesus. Thank you. going to close our service with uh, a song, a song that will hopefully bring together much of what we've thought about this morning. It's called The Battle Belongs to Him. Stand together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God. There's nothing impossible When all I see are the ashes You see the beauty When all I see is a cross, God You see the entity So when I find I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And Almighty Fortress, you go before. power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power Oh God, the battle belongs.